All right, Victor, founder of Worldwide Corals here yet again. This time it's Secrets of a First Take. If you're doing this for your first time or very close to that, uh, or even starting it, uh, you might want to know some of these things because it could change the total trajectory of your <laughs> tank. Starting with number one. Number one, the most important one that we have touched this in other, um, other episodes before, listen to one source of information. Why? Too many people are gonna be telling you to do things many different ways, and there's not a specific way to do this. You can do them A, B, C, many different ways. If I could just boil it down to real distinct advice here, it's go around to the local fish stores in your area, uh, talk to a few of them, and find out which one uh, gives you confidence. That yes. somebody cares about you and your tank and wants to help you be successful. That is probably the right person, and then go back to that person every single time. Until you get better. After you, you feel like you got the hobby under control and you understand what you're doing without reading so much, then I guess you can go outside of your wheelhouse a little bit. But in the meantime, you, you really in the beginning got to stick to one source of information. All right. If that doesn't exist for you, go find it elsewhere. It gets kind of difficult from there to get some reliable, consistent information. I will tell you that uh, I think one of the best things you could do is probably go watch our series, which yeah. is the five minute guide to reefing. It's five little bits, five minutes on a bunch of different chunks. Uh, not information that's in there isn't just uh, stuff that I learned. It's all the reefers in the whole building. It's all of my mentors, including Victor. And when I need to know things, I go to all my mentors. It's all compiled into one little uh, bit of information. This will be a successful path for you. but. Don't do uh, uh, what I did, which is go ask, you know, 60 different people to get 60 different pieces of advice and then meld it together because uh, it gets becomes a bumpy road. That you're more confused. Past. It, very, very confused. Uh, so that is, uh, I think, the best piece of advice that uh, you shared right away. And I'm so happy because it's like I share this like deep to my soul. Good. Uh, listen to one source of information. Uh, number two, think about this in your first tank. Plan for time. Mm -hmm. You cannot rush this. This is a hobby that we see someone with a beautiful tank. We want to mimic it right away. This is not something money can buy. It takes time, patience, you know, and preparation for it. So don't don't you set up your first tank and lose patience within a month or two. Average tank to look good, it takes close to a year to look good, would you say? That's a fair time. There's ways to speed it up. Yeah, but, but I think on average, that's an average, average number. That's average. I mean, mm -hmm. me knowing what I know, I'm not trying to sound like whatever big hit or whatever. I can put a tank together three to four or five months and it looks pretty good. But for the average person that's new to the hobbies, you shouldn't expect your tank to look good within the first six months to a year. Normally after the first year is when you're, you start bragging about your tank. The first mm -hmm. six months are tough, you're ready to quit. Second six months are like, oh, I'm pretty good at this. And then after year one, you're starting to brag and you're ready to set up a farm, you know? I would say if, if this is not your first rodeo, you've done this many times, uh, n nothing is certain, there's always a, a, a variables, but a lot of people could probably have a tank up and running and have it pretty successful inside of six months if, if you've done this many times. Yes. If you just choose to listen to one person that's done it successful, uh, somewhere between that six and 12 months mm -hmm. is very likely. If you choose to listen to everybody, we're kind of <laughs> tying these together, uh, your success point probably looks like two years plus. Cause if you, you ever uh, succeed. Oh my God, you're gonna r r run all the different waves of problems. So uh, yeah, plan for some time and think about when you have the actual time to do this. So uh, for me, even just reading this, thinking about it, like I don't think I'd set up a tank in June or July because I'm outside all the time, right? Gotcha, that's you uh, guys. In Florida, yeah. we're different. In Florida's different. We're all the time. Okay, but in uh, uh, Minnesota, like, you know what a great time to do this? January, February, March, I'm locked in my house, it's cold outside, and I got nothing to do. Give me a project like this, this there is perfect go. for me. Cool. Uh, so plan for some time because it is gonna take a little bit of time to do, but enjoy the process. Uh, another secret of a first tank. Don't make it over complicated. Mm -hmm. Use the kids method, keep it simple, okay? Mm -hmm. um, when, when first setting up a tank, the, the natural thing to do is to get as much equipment as we can, mm -hmm. as much modern equipment as we can, computers this, computer that. I, I think the way that I, I, I like to think about it is, think about your, if this is your first rodeo, like consider like mostly the fish and coral and husbandry 
And then the system architecture too. I mean, and I'm probably making it sound too complex when I call it system architecture, but it's just, I got a, ha a heater, I've got some flow, I got a return pump, I got some plumbing, Lights. I got some lighting, uh, leave I'm it good. alone, right? I'm good. All right. But right past the system architecture, once you got uh, your wheels running, like nothing's probably going to break in the next six months, right? Six months from now, all right, I, I understand how this all works. Now let's set up some kind of monitor in the tank. So if the That's heater breaks, right. the light breaks, it tells me. You right? want to top off, yeah. you know, all those things. I start implementing these things as time goes on, learn them as we go. And then when that's all good, like, well, maybe I really actually want a controller at this point now because when the heat, like heater fails, it's nice that it told me so I can run home to go turn it off. But, you know, maybe better I just turn it off. Yeah. Uh, from my phone, or even better, write some code that does that thing. So yeah, don't overcomplicate it either. Trying to learn all of the science or all of the uh, gear, just keep it simple, and you'll probably be successful. Yeah. What about number four? Uh, water changes covers all kinds of mistakes. End of story. You can make a lot of mistakes if you do 10% water changes every week, or roughly 30 once a month, which is a, in a similar mm -hmm. scenario. You can make a lot of mistakes, and you never know it. Yeah, as long as you don't go to waggy overfeeding, it should fix most of the mistakes of the water changes. You know, uh, we did a math on this, and uh, everybody I tell this to is surprised. But uh, if you figured out, like, whatever your nitrate level would be, like I did a month of feeding, and it would be, you know, four parts per million at the end of the month. Okay. If I do 10% water changes every week, it will never go above double that. So it will never go above eight, ever as long as the input is the same, right? So if I it's just- math. Yeah, it's just like it's has a dilution factor, It's dilution, right? yeah. Uh, we actually did a video on that, you should go look, check it out. But it, it, it is like, you could figure out even like exactly where, where you want to peg it at and pick the water change solution to fix it. But 10% a week or roughly 30-ish uh, a month actually keeps it really low perpetually uh, so you know water changes you can make so many so many mistakes many of which are unknown like you can't test for the fact that i had uh, roundup on my hand uh, and when i went yeah. in the tank right it's just stuff is dying uh, lotion shampoo yep. soaps all kinds of things and a lot of them aren't like immediately toxic it isn't like so much poison at all just like uh, overwhelms the tank everything kicks the bucket it's actually like when i did the lotions today and the next day it was roundup and then uh, you know it was and it just keeps accumulating but if i keep doing the 10 percent water changes all the time nothing ever accumulates the same direct same oh, way we get it all out so uh, if I had one secret for everybody, do your 10% weekly, 30% a month, uh, one or the other, and you'll have a totally different trajectory. All right, next one? Yes, uh, number five. Choosing the right size aquarium. Okay, this is uh, one I'm dying to know what you think is the right size aquarium for a brand new reefer. For a brand new, we're talking about the average person who's just getting into the hobby. I would recommend between 50 and 100 gallons. That's just my opinion. Anything under 50, I feel like it's too small. And over 100, it becomes where your water changes is starting to become on the bigger size. Mm -hmm. Changing 10, 20%, you're changing 10, 20 gallons of water. Doesn't sound like a lot until you're carrying four of those buckets around your house. Yep. You got to dump them in your toilet. What do you think? I'm not in a dissim dissimilar area. The, the difference is like, you know, cost and lifestyle. size and weight and lifestyle. lifestyle too. So I would say that if you told me you really wanted to set up a 40 breeder, I wouldn't say it was wrong, but understand that- Borderline on the small it, side. Borderline on the small side. Below that is a bad idea for a breeder. Yeah, reaper. for 30 and under, consider nano. Like, and the reason, the reason for that is like, say if I set up a, a 20 gallon tank and uh, I was overfeeding right, per se, uh, versus a hundred tank, well, it's, the 100 gallon tank is five times as big, which means my overfeeding problem is going to take five times as long. I mean, if it took two months to take a problem, uh, be a problem in a, in a uh, 100 gallon tank, it will take 10 months to be a problem, right? I'd catch it before it became that problem. Or worse yet, I say this one all the time, what happens in June and July when, when the temperature? Well, for here, when a barbecue and a baseball game sounds like a lot better than a water change. Right, my 20 gallon tank isn't going to survive that as well as my 100 gallon tank. Uh, That's true. You know, when life have, has good things and bad things that happen, and it uh, they're inevitable. 
the 20 gallon tank does not survive that as well. So 40 gallon is minimum, but if I had to pick one tank size that I thought was one of the best for everybody, it's a 120. Okay. Four foot, two by two, gives a lot of space oh, for aquascape. Oh, it's one of my favorite tank. It's a gorgeous tank. Uh, it isn't that much more expensive than a 90. It takes almost the exact same lighting and gear. It's the same, you're like, right. Minimal cost, extra, better aquascape, really robust. You're probably gonna be successful with it. Has buffer for a new reefer. You can make lots of mistakes and you probably will never even know. Yeah, Right. I agree. So uh, You can get it on with two lights. The only bit is a 10% water change in a 120 is a little bit more than two buckets of water. Yeah. Right. Well, by the way, one of the reasons I like 10% uh, is with 10%, I can mix it up right in the buckets and uh, do it right in the tank. I'm not worried about getting temperature correct or any gotcha. of that stuff because 90% of the water is temperature correct. It yeah. Ain't, it ain't gonna make that yeah, it doesn't deal. make much of a difference because only 10% got you. Obviously, I have to do it more frequently. But if I did a 30% water change, I should probably have temperature correct and all the other stuff, and it's just a bigger ordeal. So mm -hmm. uh, pick whichever one's right for you. All right, number six uh, actually is another interesting one. Reliable, proven equipment. Mm -hmm. Give me an example. Uh, example, um, so um, I used to use aqua lifter pumps 20 years ago, the pump's still around. Mm -hmm. Ranko controller for your heaters or for your chiller. Mm -hmm. I used them 22 years ago, they still around, they still make them today, same company. These are items that are known for no breaking and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So I just like to stick to reliable proven equipment. Any type of equipment that you can think of? Uh, well, the Ranko one comes to mind. Uh, is, uh, I used that 18 years ago as well, and it's actually in a, the rebranded uh, Aqualogic yeah. version, uh, but that's what's running my 362. I've never once heard that thing fail anybody, uh, ever, right? It's a little bit more expensive for sure, uh, but like, with something like a temperature controller isn't reliable like the goal, right? Yeah. It's a little expensive, uh, but it also allows you to plug in your own heater to it and you can just throw them out as they're uh, wearing out. But also another reliable one to me, because uh, I had you know, a whole bunch of them, different ones fail me, Auto Top Off, Tunes Oscillator. Oh, that thing has been around forever. I was using that thing 20 years ago as well. There's new ones that come out, and they got new cool features on them. You they magnetically like couple, blah, blah, blah. They sing you songs and stuff. I don't care. I want this thing to top off my tank, and I don't want it to flood. It does you that for what? me. Another one I've been very happy with has been the MP40s. Ah, Vortex, yes. Yep, I've been uh, very happy with those power heads. You know the, the part we have, if you're brand new, this is probably important. All the rest of them, when you need to maintenance those things, it's rerouting all the cords and taking it all out. In this case, you take out the little inside off the glass, soak it, soak it put it back. Put you, it back in. If you're smart, you actually bought an extra one. You just swap it right yeah. then and there. there you go. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to think of some other ones that uh, it just seem to work for me. I and mean, I'm sure there's plenty of equipment that we can think of, but again, it's just about, just stick to, if, again, for if this is your first tank, stick to equipment that has been around and it's been proven, you know? And that actually leads right into number seven, secrets of a first tank. Buy once. Uh, when you buy those black boxes from China, those lights, and they're burned a year later. Mm -hmm. That's one example right there. You know what was interesting is uh, I went and looked at them one time and like, you know, you look, you see people who use some of that imported stuff and they're like, you know, like, hey, it worked great. And it does uh, for some people. Uh, and then other people like, no, mine burned out inside of, in six months. I went and looked at the reviews and it was so funny how polarized it was. There was like very few two, three or four. It was either I was happy with this purchase or 20% of them give it one star because it broke inside of six months, right? That's a one in five chance, man, that it's going to break on you. <laughs> so, so you're taking me an example, buy once. Do you remember this, 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 this company went out of business, um, Coralia Powerheads? Mm -hmm. They were running, and you put the, the, the hand in front of power, it was spinning backwards. Okay, yeah. So you have a power head inside your tank, consuming electricity, and you're watching it work, but it wasn't working. It was spinning backwards. It wasn't even shooting water backwards. Mm -hmm. So that's what I mean by buy ones. Just stick to reliable stuff and just buy ones. Just I'll take another angle on this, which is uh, one that I've done in my first tank. I bought four protein skimmers before I got to the right one. 
Right. Yeah. Now because, you can buy some cheap ones, I'm sure. I bought the cheapest possible one, and then that one didn't really do what I want. It actually flooded my floor. Uh, then I bought the second cheapest one, and then I bought like accessories for it. They were like, all these things were trying to make it better, and then I finally found the right one. And the reality is all that I did is made the right one cost three times as much in the end. And it worked right away. Yeah, and it just did what I needed to do. So my counsel to most people is kind of like what we talked about earlier with water changes. Water changes will solve a lot of problems. Just do some extra water changes up front uh, and, be okay. and save your money for the thing that actually works. You'll be so happy that you A, didn't waste hundreds of bucks on something that doesn't work uh, and that you ultimately did get the thing that does. All right, next one, number eight. Don't dose until, you're, until you need the demand, until the corals need the dosing. Mm -hmm. um, one of the mistakes that new reefers do all the time, they set up a tank. They cycle it for a month, two months, whatever it is. They put a couple corals, they put a couple fish, and they've been dosing A and B every single day. And when they bring the water for us to test, your alkalinity is like 12, 13, it's through the roof. Your calcium is like 550, 600, they don't understand why. So me personally, if you set up a tank brand new, don't dose anything, no A and B, no cogwasser, no calcium reactor. Your water changes once a week, like Ryan says, is to solve those problems. Once you get better at the hobby within three to six months and you got plenty of cores and the cores, you're starting to see some growth, now check your alkalinity, check your calcium and start dosing based on that. And from there, you should start dosing. But it's to start dosing from day one, you're only going to make things worse. You're going to waste the product and it's just going to turn you off. Uh, you know, uh, when I used to man the phones, uh, I had this one all the time. Like, you know, hey, you know, Jerry told me that I needed to dose two part in Kilkwasser and all this other stuff. They never really gave any guidance as to how. No, the tank was brown, the brown new like, rocks. And then, like, my alkalinity is uh, 18. Like, well, yeah, dude, because. You were dosing something you didn't need to dose. Yeah, but uh, whatever, you know, you didn't tell me. So yeah, don't do that. Uh, actually test, and if it's dropping, now it's time to find a solution to fix that. Usually it's a two-part. So yeah, we tell people all the time, it's very simple. I mean, it's, it's a lot of people don't get this. Um, once you start dosing uh, calcium and alkalinity, it's very simple. You test your alkalinity today. Let's say your alkalinity says it's nine. Uh, you start dosing five millimeter of alkalinity. If in two days the alkalinity went up, then you're dosing too much. If you're dosing the five millimeters in a day for two days and the alkalinity went down, you're not dosing enough. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty simple. It's just dose, see if it went up, see if it went down within two days and make the correct adjustment. All right, okay, this leads right into that number nine. Well, how often would you tell a brand new reefer to measure calcium, alkalinity, and magnesium, probably all at different rates? First two months, I wouldn't even test for that. None. I don't see no value on that. Even if you have a few calls in there, like, because you're gonna be doing water changes once a week. Okay. I will say after month two or three, I will check my alkalinity for a regular hobbies maybe two or three times a week, mm -hmm. and maybe the salinity and the nitrous and phosphates once a week. I guess I think you're right in the fact you're not gonna get a tremendous amount of value in those initial weeks. The one thing for a new reefer you might get is just experience using the test kit. Yeah. Right? Uh, like, okay, I got a pulse, I'm looking for trends, I'm not I'm looking to a, nail a number. I'm just afraid a new hobbyist yeah. is gonna see some wrong numbers, gonna try to make adjustments, and in reality, the tank has only got a Recordia, a leather, and a burn nest. So <laughs> the, the, the tank there's no need, what do you, you did a water change, why are you checking for magnesium and alkalinity and calcium, which there's gonna be some, there's nothing soaking it up, so, me personally, first two, three months, leave that alone. If you want to practice in the meantime, that's one thing. But the problem is if they start practicing and they see, maybe they don't do the water test right and then they see wrong numbers and they're going to start making adjustments and that goes to your complicated thing and you will crash in your new tank. You know what, uh, <laughs> Elliot, <laughs> another one of my mentors, Elliot, actually right. told me a similar thing about fish. Uh, I, I was like, hey, so do you think it'd be a good idea to tell somebody to like really watch the fish for the first couple of hours and like, you know, plan on being around to check out and they like, no, absolutely not. I think the best thing you could do is put the fish in and leave. Uh, you're going to stress the fish out looking at him. Well, no, because you're going to stress out. And it, it, he just like went around the earth and all these other things. He's going to be stressed out in there. He's going to have weird behavior and he's going to look funny in there. And then you're not going to help be able to help yourself, but like try to fix it. 
you know. Oh, uh, you're right. Yeah. Oh, he's tripped. Let me put another fish. Let me feed him. <laughs> Move you, it. Yeah. Get him out. You're trying to push him out of the hole or whatever. Like, you're yeah. right. Like, dangling shrimp in front of his face. Like, you've been in there for five minutes. Why don't you eat? That's uh, why, guys. So, again, <laughs> test for your salinity, your nitrous for the first two, three months, once a week. Check for your alkalinity about two times a week on the first two, three months. After that, you can start testing for everything. Uh, interesting. Uh, all right, this one is actually really, really good. It, uh, a lot of people, if you're a, a big fan of, uh, of watching YouTube, so you probably already heard, but if this is you know, one of your first rodeos, listen to this one more important than probably anything else you heard today. Number 10, secrets of a first tank. Utilitarian fish. Make sure that the fish that you put in your tank, they're not just good looking fish, okay? First of all, you need to make sure they get along, they're not aggressive towards each other, but the most important one, most of the fish in your tank, they should have a purpose. For instance, when you have tanks, they take care of the algae, the herbivores, right? They keep your tank nice and clean. When they poop, they help for nutrients for your fish because they're the bigger fish. Then you got your rasses, it helps you with all the parasites. You got your algae blennies, the scraping the rocks like you were saying earlier, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, what else can we think of? Uh, Aptasia eating filefish. Aptasia eating filefish, copper band eating the aptasias as well. So the goal is that these fish, they serve a purpose in their environment and the ecosystem that you're putting them in. Not every fish has to do that. For instance, there's always a flame hog fish. Doesn't do nothing, but it's chill on the rocks and look at you. You know, but there's always, there's nothing wrong with putting a fish or two, but mainly when you put this fish, just think of them benefiting your reef. Think about all these things, and I guess if this is your first rodeo, you don't even know what any of these things are, but like, the, the best part of it is if I added a Tamini Tang, a Fox Face, an Aptasia eating Filefish, and a couple of Rasses, the good news is you'll never probably have these problems because they will catch them before they ever became yeah, a problem. It's true. Uh, so utilitarian fish. The one piece in here more than all the rest is probably those algae eating ones because algae is probably used to be one of the biggest pains in the butt with a reef tank. We're now controlling nitrate, but if we also put animals in there that eat it for a living. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, his team is the one that called it utilitarian fish to me yeah. the first time. And I like, it was the puzzle pieces that came together for me. Yeah, it's like we all pass that information with each other, you know? But Actually, my first tank had that exact problem, which is uh, I had a yellow tang in there. The tank looked awesome. Uh, and then the yellow tang died at one point in time. And then the tank went totally to crap, right? And I didn't really know. I guess it wasn't paying enough attention, but like that fish was in there all day Picking. eating algae. Yeah. I put a new yellow tang in, all of the algae went away. There it didn't go. go away. Something ate it. You now know, you know, all, utilitarian. All uh, next one, uh, 11. Don't load it too fast. All right. What's too fast? Too fast. Um, um, we mentioned this earlier in a couple of the episodes that we filmed. People here in the United States, they want to cycle their tanks. Supposedly, we tell people two months, people are not even waiting two weeks. And then after two weeks, they keep bringing our water samples. When we take the water sample, we're checking for ammonia. Finally, when they don't have ammonia, we tell them, okay, your tank is cycle, you can add some stuff. To them, they don't listen to some stuff. They listen, I'm all in. Mm -hmm. And they start loading too much fish, too many snails, too much shrimp, too many corals, and then the system goes right back into an ammonia cycle, and then they start losing stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd say also there are ways to like insta-tank a tank. But we're talking about secrets of a first tank, not secrets of I've been of doing pro. this for 15 years. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we can mm -hmm. put a tank together overnight at trade shows and leave them up for weeks and nothing will die. But this, it's not the case. We know what we're doing. And if this is your first rodeo doing this for the very first time, uh, Insta Tank is not the path. Like, no. In fact, enjoy the, the journey, <laughs> man. And like, we're actually trying to build a tank cycle method uh, that like is repeatable, proven out with data, uh, and uh, you know, sharing all the uh, like you know over a year's worth of different types yeah, of cycling. Yeah, last time I was here, I saw all the stuff you were doing. So in, in that uh, spirit, like we'd like to get to a path of like, hey man, just do it this way, and you'll be successful like uh, here is the, like it's like the toll house cookie recipe on the back of the bag just do this and the cookie will be good you know uh so we'd like to get to, to that kind of advice to the point that also hopefully we'll all recommend that to each other that hey here is just a path that works you know yeah <laughs> all right so number uh 12 here pick a coral type rather than all coral types mm. so uh, you can't help it, but when you get a new tank, you want to have everything. You want everything under the rainbow. You want every species of corals. And the matter of the fact is that 
if you're a new hobbyist, you need to learn your calls and understand which calls are easier and which calls are harder to keep, and then make your decision based on that, not just on looks, you know, mm -hmm. based on how the aquascape is going to look, how's the final, what's your final vision looks like, pick a tank that you kind of like. Preferably, if it's your first rodeo, I recommend sticking to softies with some LPS, mm -hmm. then, then move up to more LPS and maybe some SPS, you know. If I had any counsel for somebody doing this first time, like, Go get like some euphilia, some uh, eh, lords, candy canes, eh, uh, leathers, mushrooms, a couple of montiporas, just I some mean, basic stuff. God forbid the green star polyps and zinnia, they can't help but like watch them. They're cool. Funny you say that. A lot of zinnia mm -hmm. is a very good hobby, coral for a beginner, but if the tank is not established, it will melt. Oh, really? If you set up a new tank, it's been set up for a month or two and it's kind of like too clean and too new, and if I send you zinnia, it won't take off. You know, it's funny. We're having a lot of die-off on Xenia that we're sending to new customers. You really, I, but every time they're sending us a picture with a new tank, we're like, oh, because they, they're here so easy for a new hobbyist. I couldn't kill it. Yeah. But they set up a new tank, and it's dying because I'm telling you, it's, it's just too new. It's too clean. I only had it in one tank. Actually, it was the coolest thing. The first tank, it was a whole sheet on the whole side of the tank. Take up the whole paint. Yeah. Uh, I think it was like one of my biggest nutrient exports, actually. This pulsing Xenia. It is it cool. I love it. I would cut it off and scrape it up all the way to the last couple of inches, and inside of a month, it would like almost replace the whole thing. You know, uh, very cool beginner coral. Uh, but like all those corals <laughs> like that are great, great corals, uh, like mushrooms and zoanthids and pallies and all that kind of stuff, cinularia, all really cool, fast growing corals that like uh, are not difficult to care for as well. Uh, in low light, which means also you don't have to spend a fortune on light as well. Yeah. Oh, and flow to compensate to match the light. Yeah. You know? So, way, way, way cheaper. Uh, this one actually uh, is near and dear to my heart, too. Uh, Secrets of a first tank number 13. Put the tank where you can see it and enjoy it. <clears throat> where would you put it? Okay, I got two picos in my office. They're both on my desk. Mm-hmm. Um, I did a video one recently. One is a three and a half gallon tank, and the other one is a two and a half gallon. Actually, it's three point two one, and the other one's a two point five. They're both on my desk. I want to enjoy them. I want to see them because they're so small. Mm -hmm. um, where will you put it? I can do where I never would put it. Okay. Uh, where it's probably one of the more common places in Minnesota anyway is in a basement that I never go in. Right? Okay. But the basement is like a really common place to do because these things are heavy. Right, put it right in the cement, down in the basement, it's family rooms. Uh, sometimes there's a room behind it, like a furnace room, you can put all the gear and stuff in. And that's cool if your family goes down there every day. If your family does not go down there every day, no. uh, what is not seen goes to crap every time, right? And before, it's just expensive too. You spend a lot of money and time caring for this thing. Not to be able to yeah. see it all the time. Okay, <clears throat> the way that you enjoy this thing is visually. Yeah. And if I can't see it, it well, I'm not even enjoying all of it. So put it in the living room. Uh, I love the living room. Yeah. Have you ever taken Kitchen? a tank out of a living room? Once you have it for a while and you take it out, it's mm -hmm. like you, the life gets sucked out of the, the house. It does. It brings Every time pet into there. It's so weird when you remove an aquarium out of a house. It's like it's quiet. You don't hear the water no more. Mm -hmm. it's the visual's not there. It just feels weird. Okay, you know, another reason I like it in the living room area is generally it's visible from when the door, when you open it up and friends come in, right? And they all just gravitate to it. Yeah, of course. Uh, and so kids come running up to it and they're like, you know, your kids actually want to come to your house. Uh, to see the aquarium. To see the aquarium, you know, instead of like, oh, do I have to? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you know, think about where you're going to put these things, where you're going to put your first tank because it will matter. Those were 13 secrets of the first tank. Yep. If you listen to all those, you'll probably have a better road. Yep. Thank you for sharing all of your knowledge. All right, Ryan. Nice coming, buddy.